Welcome back everybody. Let's continue to talk about conformity and let's focus this time on some classic research that defines this area. So let's first put conformity into perspective. What does it mean to conform? Conformity is really just a tendency for people to change their thoughts, their feelings, their behaviors, so that they are consistent with group norms. In other words, when someone conforms, they actually change their thinking, their feeling, or what they're doing because of some form of social pressure. So to truly assess conformity, if you think about it, we need to know how a person would have acted with no added social pressure, such as when they're alone or when they're not in the presence of other people. I mentioned that people conform to group norms. What exactly are group norms? Norms are societal rules for how we think and how we behave. Let me give you some examples. One basic societal rule is that you shake hands with someone when you meet them, or you look people in the eye when you speak with them. Uh, another rule is something that we don't typically think about a lot, but unless a movie theater is really crowded, you never sit right next to another person because that would be creepy. Another norm is simply to say please and thank you. Another norm would be that you don't pick your nose in public, or you don't burp in public, or you don't fart in public. Really, people, don't burp and don't fart in public. Those are group norms. So some norms we, we speak about and we teach our kids. Others remain unspoken. But in general, we all know and understand these norms. When it comes to this topic, Americans hate being labeled as conformists. And that's partially because we really value our independence and we don't like admitting that we're being influenced by somebody. That's partly because we live in such an individualistic culture, but we all conform and often without realizing it. For example, check out this picture of a group of non-conformists. They're clearly different from the rest of society, but even they conform to each other. You can see that they're all wearing black leather, they're wearing some type of chain or dog collar around their neck. They have relatively dark makeup. So in other words, we do really value our independence, but conformity is pervasive. It's everywhere. You don't need to look far to find it. When you look at society in general, you see conformity in all kinds of places. Look at our appearance. Look at the clothes that we choose to wear. There's not all that much variation. We are all mostly conforming to each other. Look at hair, look at makeup. There's all kinds of conformity. To some extent, most of us conform to social roles when it comes to our behaviors. And most of us take on many roles. You might see that you act in particular ways when you're taking on that role as parent compared to when you are taking on a role as store manager compared to when you are taking on a role as student. In each of those situations, the same person is you, except you're conforming to different social roles, you're performing different behaviors in each one of those circumstances. Although people don't think about this very often, there's often conformity with our thoughts. Think, for example, about religious beliefs. Why do you think there are so many Christians in the United States? One reason is because there are so many Christians in the United States. So when it comes to people selecting a religion, people are often just conforming to the group norm. Our emotional reactions even conform to other people. Think about social referencing. What that is all about is that when something happens, we often look to other people to see how they're reacting so that we can figure out how to react ourselves. So you can see via conformity, we allow society to set a lot of our own personal agenda. This just demonstrates how powerful situational forces can be. All right, well, keep in mind that we conform to social norms, and that's not always a bad thing. For example, norms help maintain order. You know, we know to be polite. We know to wait our turn. We know that we're not supposed to steal things from our neighbors. We know we're not supposed to cheat on our spouses. In other words, norms help us know what to expect so that life is somewhat more predictable. For example, we expect that people will drive on the right side of the road and that medical doctors will wear lab coats or scrubs. But conforming to social norms isn't always wonderful for society. Norms can be hard to break so they can maintain the status quo. Because of social norms, social change often moves at a snail's pace and society often suffers as a result. Think about what happens when you break a norm. When you break a norm, you often get punished. We get socially sanctioned. We might be shunned by others. We might be harassed by others or publicly embarrassed. So you can indeed break norms. You know, you, you can decide to do your own thing and be different. 
but you also might end up paying a pretty hefty price for that. That's what typically happens. But if you're really innovative and really forward thinking, you might also end up changing the world by successfully challenging social norms. Next, let's discuss how norms develop. In 1936, remember we're talking about classic research here, Musafer Sharif studied how norms develop in small groups. He used a really interesting optical illusion called the autokinetic effect. Let me demonstrate for you what it's all about. If you're in a completely darkened room, and you can try this for yourself, just, just be in essentially a completely darkened room. If there's like a, a spot of light beamed on a wall, that spot will look like it moves. Just go ahead and, and look at that spot of light in a darkened room. It eventually is going to look like it moves. And it's not moving at all. There are various reasons why that might happen. In a completely dark room, you don't have much social reference. You Keep in mind that your body is really always moving. You can't keep yourself completely still. So as you're moving, it, it kind of might appear as though the dot is moving. Your eyes are constantly moving. Your eyes are never completely still. So in other words, we're moving even though that dot isn't moving. But because we have no reference points, because we're in a dark space, it will appear, it's simply an optical illusion, that that dot moves. So it's important to understand this point. Any movement that you perceive is purely subjective because it's not moving at all. So based on that understanding, let's talk about the research study that Sharif created. He put people in a situation where they observed that dot on a wall and they were together with other group members. And then each group member was asked individually, how much did that dot move? And people would respond with some number of inches. So the first person might say it moved uh, five inches. The other person might say four inches. The other person might say five inches. And then that group would go through a series of trials where they would beam the light on the wall again and they would ask them again, how far did that beam of light move? So let's take a look at the results. First of all, it's important to understand that when we measure conformity or the existence or the creation of a group norm, we first want to measure people when they're alone, when there's no social pressure, when there's no social influence. So before these people went into a group situation, they were presented with that light on a wall and they were asked how much did that light move. So here are just some hypothetical results. Imagine that there were three people taking part in this group. So someone might have said that on average it moved about one inch, another person two inches, another person eight inches. So you can see there's really a lot of variability between these people. And, and that's good. We would usually want a group to start out that way. So then Sharif and his colleagues would put the people together. So here's the first group session. And again, they'd have a series of trials and they'd beam that light on a wall. And then they'd ask that first person, how far did the light move? Uh, about two inches, next person, about three inches, next person, about four inches. And you can already see that their estimates are somewhat converging together. And then they get together for the second group session. And again, they go through the same thing. I believe it moved about two inches, uh, about three inches, uh, about four inches. And then they get together for another session. And what's interesting is over time, a group norm is established. So these people are very influenced by each other's estimates, so much so that eventually their estimates converge on essentially one group estimate. So in other words, conformity has taken place. Until this point, researchers had never actually seen a norm develop in front of their own eyes. This lab procedure was really a great way to demonstrate that norm formation is one byproduct of social influence. It's really pretty interesting. Sharif would use confederates who he would plant into the group, who would provide unusually high estimates for how much the light moved to try to inflate the group norm that was established. And Sharif was able to document that the Confederates' influence persisted for like up to five generations of group membership as one individual member was replaced with another group member to essentially refresh the group. There's even some evidence to show that the Confederates can continue to influence individual participants when they're tested alone like one year later after the original group experience. That's really pretty amazing stuff because remember that light doesn't move at all. So let's talk about what was going on in these people's minds. 
the situation that they were in was really very ambiguous. And in those situations, the participants look to their peers for guidance. And that seems like a reasonable thing to do because when we're faced with uncertainty, other people provide us with a valuable source of information. They help us understand and interpret what's going on. So what's the take home message? When we're in an ambiguous situation, when we're uncertain about something, other people can have lots of influence over us. That is indeed true, but it also got researchers wondering what would happen in situations that are less vague and more objective. Would people still show a tendency to conform? That's exactly what Solomon Ash wanted to know. He wanted to know, do people conform in more objective social situations? So in 1951, he examined conformity to group pressure in a specific situation when the group was clearly incorrect. Let me explain to you the task that the research subjects engaged in. They thought they were in a study that was looking at uh, sensation and perception and specifically the perception of lines. So they would be shown a standard line and then a set of comparison lines. And their task was very simple. Just simply determine which one of the comparison lines is most equal in length to the standard line. Now keep this in mind. When we're talking about something like conformity, we're talking about a change in people's thoughts, feelings, or behaviors. So if we're going to assess conformity, we first need to have a handle on how people would have acted when alone, when there was no group pressure. So Ash set up his study so that there was a control group that performed this task alone with nobody around. And in that situation, 99% of the time, they picked the correct comparison line. So clearly it's a very objective task. There's one right answer and you're gonna get that right answer virtually every single time. So this is where things got interesting. In the actual study, the research subject would be in a group situation with other research subjects. Now those other research subjects were actually confederates of the experimenter. So there might have been four or five other people in the room, but they were all working with the experimenter. And on 12 of the 18 trials that the entire group went through, they were going to give an incorrect response. So on 12 of the 18 trials, the confederates might have said, uh, the line that's most close to the standard line is C. And C is clearly the incorrect answer. What Ash wanted to know was would he find conformity from the research subjects in this situation? Well, the results are really amazing. It turns out that subjects conformed to that incorrect group about 37% of the time. So on more than one third of the trials, they picked the incorrect line, even though they must have obviously known what the correct line was. And keep this in mind, there was no overt pressure. None of the Confederates, none of the other people in the group said anything to the subject to pressure the subject to give an incorrect answer. Given how objective this situation was, that's a pretty high conformity rate. In fact, only 25% of the subjects refused to conform at all. And that always makes me think, what makes them so resilient? What is it about them that stays so strong in the face of social pressure? So this was really important research at the time because the take home message was even in objective situations where there's really no ambiguity at all, group pressure can lead to significant conformity. Keep in mind that as social animals, we desperately want to fit in with the group. We want to have a place along with our peers. And that means we're going to be motivated to avoid acting too conspicuous, uh, like an outsider or like a misfit. Nobody wants to be seen as a misfit. And that's at least one other reason for why we see such conformity among human beings. All right, well, that's it for this section, but stay tuned because there's more social psychology coming up soon. <laughs>